Thank you very much um, for putting together this nice workshop and for having me and giving me an opportunity to present some of the recent work that we did together with um, Marc Mézard, Florent Jacala and uh, with Lenka Steborova in Paris. And in some sense, um, my talk is going to be complementary to, to the one that Nati just gave. Uh, complementary in the sense that I completely agree with the notion that the dynamics are very important if you want to understand what drives generalization in neural networks. But I feel like that there's a second big part to the puzzle, and that's the data, or the data sets that we train the networks on. Okay? And that's sort of putting us in a bit of a pickle, because we still lack mathematical tools to reason about real-life data. Okay? And what's even worse is we don't even have good theoretical models for data. Right? There's, there's two ways, or, or two things that we can usually uh, do. We can either make assumptions or we can either make no explicit assumptions about the data distribution, right? We can just say um, we ignore the data completely, um, we get some bounds, and what that really means usually is we assume the data comes from some worst case distribution. Um, and the other way is to say, well, okay, we have some target functions, that's usually some, some random function of some random IID inputs, but what both of these approaches have in common by construction is they're blind to any type of structure that we see in real life data, okay? And so the aim of this work was to find a generative model for, for structured data sets. And if I say structure, I have two types um, of structure in mind, okay? And, and both of them can be illustrated with even a simple data set like MNIST. Um, the first type of structure concerns the input. So what are you feeding into your neural network, okay? So for MNIST, these would be uh, the famous MNIST digits, okay? They live in some high dimensional space, 784 dimensional space. Um, but of course, not any point in this high dimensional space is an MNIST image. And indeed, most of these image, MNIST images, they will concentrate on some lower dimensional manifold in, in R to the P. And, and this manifold is really hard to define, right? And you, you can't really write it down, but it's tangible. You can, for example, measure its dimension, and using different methods, you will find that the dimension is something like 14 or 13. Okay? But in any case, it's much lower than the 784 of the MNIST images. And so we're going to call input structured if they have this, this property that they concentrate on some manifold, and we're going to call the position of an input on this manifold its latent, um, its latent representation. Okay. So that's structure in the inputs. Now, the second type of structure that we find in data set concerns the task, or in other words, the function of the inputs that you're trying to learn. Okay. So for MNIST, this can be many things. This could, for example, be the value of the digit in the image, okay, or this could be whether the um, image is showing an odd or an even number. Um, but here we're going to concentrate on cases where this is a scalar, okay, and we're going to look at two models, okay. One is what we will call, mostly for historical reasons, um, a teacher task, and that will be a label or a case where the label is a function of the whole input. So in MNIST's case, you know, this would be a function of all the pixels in the image. And the other case, which I find a bit more interesting, is what we will call a latent task. And that's the case where the label is a function of the latent representation of the, of the image, right? So both of the examples that I gave here for tasks on MNIST, those would be examples of latent tasks, okay? Um, now that we have these two types of structure, um, let me show you how they actually show up in the performance of neural networks and in, in their dynamics. Um, and to give you these two examples, let's um, look at two-layer neural networks. Okay, um, let's take the input layer very big and look at networks of k hidden units where k is smaller than the input dimension. Nothing fancy here, okay, just the standard uh, two-layer network with activation function g. And then I'm going to train these networks using SGD on some problem, okay? And here I'm going to train them on two different problems. Um, one is what I will call the MNIST task, okay? And that's just what I alluded to before. That's the task of discriminating odd from even numbers in the MNIST database. So your inputs will be the MNIST images, and then you have some binary code for the two labels. The second task is um, the vanilla teacher student task, okay? And that's something uh, that's basically a random function of random inputs that we talked about earlier. So here the idea is that you generate the training set by feeding random IID inputs through a random neural network, okay? We're going to call that network the teacher. And then the inputs are, you know, the, the Gaussian inputs and the true labels are just the output of the teacher network and you're trying to, to learn that function, try to reconstruct it. Okay, and this is something that comes from, from statistical physics and, and that has quite a bit of history and quite a bit of analysis um, done on it. Okay, now let me show you an example of where training these neural networks on these two problems um, goes pretty differently. Okay, and the first example is what happens when I train independent students on the same problem. Okay, so I'm just going to take two networks, same activation function, same number of hidden units, same everything, except that I start them from slightly different initial conditions, but they're still drawn from the same distribution, okay, small Gaussians. 
And what I plot here is um, at the end of training, what's the fractional generalization error on this MNIST task. Okay? And I plot this as a function of the number of parameters in the model. Okay? And as you can see, and as you would expect, you know, as you increase the number of parameters in the model, performance gets better, and then at some point it seems to level off. Okay? Fair enough. Um, now let me compare these two networks. Okay, so now I'm going to take an MNIST image, I'm going to forget about its true label, and I'm just going to ask, okay, these two networks, do they agree on their classification of this image? Do they both say it's an odd number or not? Okay, and again I'm plotting this now in orange as a function of, of parameters in the model, and you can see that, okay, the number of images on which these two networks disagree is roughly in line with the number of images that they misclassify. So, okay, that makes sense. Um, but now let me compare the networks again, but using Gaussian inputs. Okay, so now I'm sort of testing them over the whole of R to the P. And what we found is that actually as you increase the model size, um, pretty quickly these two networks learn completely different functions. Okay, and even for you know, moderate network sizes, and in particular, even as the generalization error goes down, the functions that these two networks learn completely diverge. Okay? And that's quite interesting because it's telling us something about overfitting, right? In some sense, these networks overfit because as we extrapolate and test the networks away from the MNIST manifold, we see that they do crazy things which are not at all correlated to each other anymore. Okay, um, and yet, this does not hurt generalization, right? Generalization goes, goes down or stays constant. And that's because they agree on the MNIST manifold. Okay? So that, at least for me, is, is quite interesting in and of itself. The point I'm trying to make here, though, is that what's interesting about this is that it's quite different from what you would observe, observe in this teacher-student setup. In this teacher-student setup, in the vanilla teacher-student setup, what happens if you increase the number of parameters in your model is that in function space, these two networks will converge. And at some point, you know, you've learned pretty much the same function in both cases, no matter where you started from. So that's one big difference in the, in the performance of neural networks, if you will. Um, the other difference that shows up in these two-layer networks concerns the dynamics, and that's the existence of, of plateaus. Okay? So here I'm plotting, now as a function of training time, the test error of, of neural networks. In orange, I plot the networks that were trained on MNIST, and you can see you know, it's just an exponential decay, and then you hit some error, and you, you, you're going to stay at that value. In blue, I'm plotting the same thing, but now for the networks trained in the teacher-student setup. And what you see there is that you have these extended periods during training where the error stays somewhat constant, and then at some point there's something that in physics you call the, the specialization transition. It's a bit like a phase transition. The network picks up some of the structure in the task, and you have a sudden decrease in the generalization error. Now again, that's something that you only see in this synthetic uh, setup. You don't really see it on real data, especially because um, in this case I kept all the hyperparameters constant. Okay? So there's no adjustment of the learning rate or anything like that that, that would explain that. These plateaus are well known in these models, okay? but they are sort of an artifact of, of the setup. So these are two examples where this structure in the data set show up. Okay? So now let me go back to my original goal. right? And now with what we've talked about structure, we can make that a bit more precise. What I want is a generative model for data sets that has structured inputs like MNIST, they need to be concentrated on some manifold, and I want to have a latent task that I need to learn it. Okay? And what we propose in this, in this recent paper is the hidden manifold model, okay? and that's a way to generate synthetic data um, that fulfills both these criteria. And the way it goes is actually pretty simple. Okay? So let's say you're in some high dimensional space, in this case three. Um, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to choose a random um, you can choose a random manifold in that space, a lower dimensional manifold. Okay? So here in this case it's just this two-dimensional um, plane. And then your points are going to be random points on this plane. Okay? Um, and then you, you, you normalize these, the number of dimension of this lower dimensional manifold. Okay? And this is going to give you the inputs. But if you just took these random points as linear combinations of these random directions, um, things are still pretty boring because all you do really is just you project the dynamics of the network down onto that manifold, and then within that manifold you still are back to this old um, IID inputs case. Okay? So what we're going to do here is we're going to take these points and we're going to put them through a nonlinear function. Okay? Something quite violent, say for example the sine or, or the error function or ReLU. And so what we do is um, we effectively fold this lower dimensional manifold back into the full R to the P. Okay? And, and so visually you, know, you see that the manifold is now distorted. And this is how we create the inputs. And now the key in this model, and so this gives us structured inputs in the sense that we talked about before. right? They're now concentrated on some lower dimensional manifold even if it's not quite easy to write it down. 
Now the key is that the labels are just a function of the position of the inputs on that lower dimensional manifold. Okay, so they're just a position of, of uh, function of c and not of x. Okay, and so this is what we call the latent task. And now I'm going to take my x's, I'm going to take my y's, I'm going to give them to you and, and you take your best shot, but you don't have access to f, you don't have access to c. Okay, and now I'll ask you, okay, train your network and, and try to learn this function. So this is this, this hidden manifold model, and the good news is that actually um, when we repeat the experiments that I showed you before with the independent students, for example, um, this, man, this model really reproduces the behavior that we saw in MNIST. Okay, so this is again the experiment with the two independent students. You can see that um, while the generalization error of one network compared to the other, if I feed it structured inputs, so inputs that live on this manifold, is roughly constant or roughly in line with the generalization error. As I test them on Gaussian inputs, it diverges and it pretty quickly goes to something that's nearly random. So here we have again this, this overfitting um, phenomenon, if you will. And the other nice thing about it is that if you look at the dynamics now of training, and this is what I plot in orange, um, you see that the plateau has disappeared. Now we see something that looks a lot more like the trajectory we had on MNIST, where you just see the exponential decay of the error, and then you stay at that value. And in blue is again the validity teacher student setup um, that I showed you before. So, okay, this model does what we want. So the question we asked ourselves is, is this some sort of minimal model, okay? Because if you think about it, we said we want to have structure in the inputs, we want to have structure in the task. There's four different ways you can now combine these two, right? Um, the vanilla teacher student model that we started from, that's unstructured inputs and unstructured task that did not look like MNIST at all. Now we have a hidden manifold model where we have structured inputs, a structured task, and that looks like what we wanted, but what's with the two cases, the two mixed cases that are left, okay? So you can, of course, have structured inputs, and you can, of course, generate labels by just applying your function, your neural network, for example, to the inputs directly. So this is like, you know, taking the MNIST image and having a function that's, you know, taking account all the pixel values. And we tested this experimentally, and we saw that this looks a lot like the teacher-student setup, the vanilla teacher-student setup, and not like MNIST. Okay, so this is not going to do it. Um, you need some structure in the task. On the other hand, of course, like by definition, it's kind of hard to have a latent task when you have unstructured inputs, right? If you have just Gaussian inputs, there's no latent representation that you can make a function of. But we sort of cheated a little bit here. And what we did is um, we just took MNIST, okay? And we trained a neural network on the MNIST odd even discrimination task, okay? Um, and after we trained the, the network, it gets, you know, 3% or something like that. Um, we then generate a data set by taking random IID inputs, unstructured inputs, but we generate the label for these inputs with this pre-trained teacher network, okay? And so while the inputs are still unstructured, this network clearly captures something about the MNIST task, right? Because it has a good generalization error on it. Um, but if you train two networks, two independent networks on this data set, it will still look like you just trained it on the vanilla teacher student setup. So what we really think is, is that if you want to model data and you want to model it in a way that really looks like, like real data, you need to have a combination of both. You need to have this structure in the inputs and you need to have some structure in the tasks that you're learning. Okay, with that let me just, just wrap up by saying, okay, so there's two types of structure in data sets and I think they're both important, at least if you want to have a good model for data, you should take them both into account. And, and one way to do that is this hidden manifold um, that I just presented to you. Uh, now, of course, there's, there's a lot of work to be done on, on this model, so we're quite excited about this. We're working on more, more theoretical analysis. What do the dynamics look like? Um, what's the performance of different models on data coming from this model? So um, stay tuned. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Or Shavir from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. I'm going to talk about a recent work I did. The recent work I did for uh, using tools from deep learning to simulate quantum systems. And I think especially for this workshop, it's interesting that it was actually the result of a series of uh, theoretical work that I did over the past uh, few years, where me and my collaborators have worked on studying the expressiveness of uh, deep learning architectures. Uh, specifically, we're looking at how different architectural features affect the uh, ability of networks to present functions for a fixed computational budget. Just to give some examples, we're looking at how uh, we've proven that deep convolutional networks are exponentially more expressive than shallow networks, and that uh, depth is not unique in this respect, that uh, having overlapping receptive fields at the convolutional layers is just as important as 
as having deep, play, uh, deep networks, and that uh, for our NANDs, uh, depth play an overall, which affects the ability to represent uh, uh, intricate uh, long-term dependencies over the input sequence, in some respect capturing the memory capacity of the network. And I think and what's interesting is, is that all these results are actually derived from a single mathematical tool that we found this equivalence between uh, network, new, new network and uh, tensor factorizations where different, uh, different factorization schemes correspond to different uh, network architectures, specifically uh, tree factorizations correspond to convolutional networks and tray factorizations uh, to recurrent networks and we are able to, in some sense, bound the expressive capacity of the network uh, by bounding the rank of its corresponding tensor factorization. So we had this tool for a few years and served us well. And about two years ago, we took a step back and realized that the, this formalism that we had for looking into neural networks is actually very similar to a formalism used by a physicist to describe quantum systems. So physicists have this uh, graphic notations for uh, tensor factorizations called tensor networks, and they use it to, to design new kinds of factorizations that are, special, that are tailor made to uh, represent uh, quantum systems, and specifically, specifically they are trying to uh, represent the wave functions of these quantum systems, where a wave function is simply a function that takes as input a grid of spin particles that can be either up or down and output a complex number. And like we try to study the expressive neural networks, they try to study how uh, well can tensor networks represent uh, systems of a given quantum entanglement. And it so happened that quantum entanglement is also related to the rank of the tensors. So we have this connection between these uh, two worlds and naturally our first instinct was to uh, take results that physicists have developed to study these systems and derive new results from machine learning, and we did just that, and the result that I mentioned for RNNs was done this way. But the next thing that we asked was, can we take the result that we had in machine learning and de derive new results for physics? And it's also true, so just a few years ago, physicists have begun using neural networks, specifically uh, shallow, fully connected networks, as an alternative approximation method of wave functions, and we wondered if uh, there's any benefit for using modern architectures. And it turns out that it's true, and based on our previous results, we're able to show that there exist uh, some specific architectures of deep convolutional networks, which can much more efficiently represent highly entangled wave functions, polynomial, polynom actually polynomially more efficient than previous methods. So we had this, we found this uh, result, and. Uh, we wonder why physicists weren't actually using these kinds of networks in practice. They're all using uh, these uh, shallow, fully connected networks. So we ask why, and more importantly, how can we actually use these kinds of networks? And just to get a sense of what physicists are trying to achieve, so what physicists are trying to achieve is known as find the ground state of a system. So you have this uh, system of uh, uh, particles, and you are given a model of how the particles interact with each other, you're essentially trying to find the state of the system at which you will have minimal energy. Formally, uh, the forces in the system are described by uh, what's known as the Hamiltonian matrix, and the energy is given by this bilinear, by this, uh, bilinear uh, form between the wave function and this matrix, a, matrix H. And we're essentially trying to minimize this optimization problem and find the best uh, parameters of the network to have minimal energy. And luckily, you can actually estimate the gradient of this objective, and so can use SGD to find the state of minimal energy. Uh, so theoretically, it seems like everything is good, but in practice, to uh, estimate the gradient, it actually requires sampling uh, according to distribution proportional to the square magnitude of the wave function, which for a general neural network means using MCMC sampling, which has high cost and so actually limits you to very tiny networks with just a few thousand parameters. So our approach was to take the architecture that we came up with theoretically, that we know that is efficient for presenting wave functions and, and modify it so it will also be efficient to sample from it. And we took inspiration from neural autoregressive models, 
which are based on the probabilistic uh, chain rule and essentially found this quantum analog to the chain rule and were able to essentially have this uh, neural autoregressive quantum state approximation, which allows to both have an efficient approximation of the wave function and also have efficient sampling, which empirically allow us to be essentially the first to train with these very large neural networks with millions of parameters compared to just a few thousands, which are possible just a year ago. And using, in doing so with an order of magnitude speed up to your training time, and allows to essentially have better precision for large quantum systems. And at this point, we're trying to get more physicists to use this method and look to see how it might affect actual a new science, essentially. So, thanks. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon. Uh, uh, my name is Omar Shehab. I, I'm a uh, theoretical computer scientist at uh, IONQ, a quantum computer startup at, based in University of Maryland. Um, in this talk, I would like to um, discuss about uh, quantum machine learning, how this new area of research kind of fits into the broader discussion of uh, deep learning. So I'd like to uh, thank uh, my wonderful collaborators um, for some of the work presented in this talk. Um, I thought I should start with these uh, two word clouds. Um, now, the left one uh, is, uh, is taken from the titles of this workshop and the right one is taken from a very recent quantum machine learning talk. As you can see, uh, the uh, highlighted terms, they are correspond to techniques and process which kind of resides at the lower levels of any deep learning stack. Um, uh, so the qu quantum computing is a model of computation. It was proposed by Richard Feynman in mid-80s. Uh, it's based on the principles of quantum mechanics. Um, the potential algorithmic advantage comes from phenomena like quantum superposition, entanglement, and measurement. Uh, there is no uh, classical analog for this uh, uh, phenomenon. And also, it is not a silver bullet uh, for NP-complete problems. Uh, the hardware is non von Neumann architecture. Uh, when you uh, input data, it is encoded in Hilbert space, uh, which is a complex vector space. Logical operations are unitary matrices. Um, readout, readout is probabilistic, which means you have to run uh, the same algorithm a number of times to get the result. And the algorithms are often visualized as quantum circuit, which is a graphical way to describe the algorithm. So for example, uh, finding an element in an unstructured database. So this is the standard way we typically write algorithm. There is an equally common way to write the algorithm, but basically by uh, using a graphical uh, method. It's known as quantum circuit. Um, uh, Research in quantum algorithm eventually uh, gener um, gave birth to a number of complexity classes. I would like to highlight two of them. One is QMA, quantum Marlin author. It is the uh, quantum analog of uh, NP problem class. And BQP, bounded quantum polynomial time, which is the quantum analog of uh, problem class P. For example, integer factoring resides in BQP, which means there is an efficient quantum algorithm for it. So you can break public key cryptography system. Um, uh, but there is no efficient uh, classical algorithm for it yet. Um, I would also like to highlight some of the quantum algorithms um, based on their impact on generating subsequent uh, research, uh, research funding. So for example, the, uh, the initial uh, funding was triggered by the early works uh, uh, from Feynman, uh, Peter Schor's factorization algorithm, and Grover's database search algorithm. Um, so those, these basically build the foundation of quantum algorithms. Then came along uh, uh, algorithms like uh, quantum chemistry simulation and uh, simulation on near-term quantum computers. This basically uh, created a wave of private industrial research for the last few years. Um, there are some quantum algorithms like a non-convex optimization for non-convex optimization problem or a special system of linear equations, which kind of related to what uh, deep learning uh, deals with. but. The relation between these algorithms, uh, 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 this progress and practical problems in deep learning are not well understood. That's why we are yet to see a web of uh, uh, industry uh, funding triggered by this set of algorithm. Uh, uh, building quantum computer is very hard. Um, when you do logical operation, this involves letting the qubits or um, placeholders for information to interact with each other in a very precise and controlled way, but these are very sensitive to noise, so at the same time, you need to protect them from unwanted noise. So this um, tug of war is very challenged to implement at the hardware level. Just a, an example, so for in GPUs, you can uh, keep computing for hours before you see the next fault. 
in quantum computer. So this is a, uh, this is basically our chip where we have 11 qubit and uh, the nodes are individual qubits and the edges are basically the possible in, uh, uh, logical operation you can do. And this bottom plot is basically for each edge, um, you can see the imprecision. So you can see that there is, uh, 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 for each operation, there is always some uh, nor error in the operation. Uh, uh, so it's so very error prone. And there are many ways quantum computing is ho hope to help uh, uh, deep learning. I'm, because of the timing constraint, I'm focusing on non-optimization uh, on near-term quantum computers. So basically, the, con uh, the concept called near, uh, noisy intermediate scale quantum computing, uh, it was coined by John Preskill uh, a few years ago. Um, the amount of computation is very limited because of the error rate. Uh, the upper bound for quantum advantage is quadratic. Um, and, but if you have some structure, know some, uh, some, uh, something about the structure of the problem, you might have a see better speed up. The question is, with this given setting, uh, sh uh, should we expect speed up? Can it help deep learning? Uh, it's not clear yet. Um, there's some good and bad news. Um, the challenges are for A, how fast you can load the input into the quantum computer. It is also known as QRAM problem. Then there are a number of challenges in the, at the algorithm level. For example, um, we know that um, there are expected um, speed up in unstructured sub database. How can we map that abstract problem into practical problems in deep learning? Um, this is just one example of those mapping problems, which are still open. And also, um, th these are non-vernomen architecture with uh, um, uh, graph. Uh, so the topology in the chip uh, can actually limit the, uh, uh, the algorithmic advantage we expect. So these are open problems we are still working on. Um, there's some progress which uh, kind of gives us some hope. For example, the algorithm uh, which uh, gives exponential speed up for spatial systems linear equation. There are, there are algorithms which gives quadratic speed up for SAT problems. There are also algorithms for gradient descent and semi-definite programming. Also, these are error-prone devices, so there are also some progress uh, in the error reduction of uh, convex non-convex optimization problem. So I guess um, this, I, I will use this opportunity to invite the deep learning community to work with quantum machine learning community and identify the challenges where we can actually work together and um, improve the whole area of research. Thank you.